Chin goes two for two at the start of the season. It's looking like he'll be the man to beat at the end of 2020. Much like the first round at Phillip Island, today's race at Laguna Seca presents the drivers with a wide variety of corners. The challenges are sure to make the cream rise to the top as we get ready to watch round three of the PRL Indy Pro 2000 series. And you'll see it all live here on the Global Sim Racing Channel and the iRacing Esports Network. Hi, I'm Joe Peek, and with me in the booth is DJ Clark. Behind the scenes is our director, Sean Crackers Ambrose, and he's using cameras provided by Dougie Beard. Laguna Seca became a flagship track for IndyCar in the 90s, leaving us with some, series, some of the series' most memorable moments. Running the Indy Pro cars here will be fitting, so let's head to our track guide to learn a little bit more about the circuit. Welcome to Laguna Seca. Located just east of Monterey, California, it's hard to deny that this is one of the more scenic American road courses. It travels up and down a hillside which not only offers spectacular views, but one of racing's most iconic corners. Clocking in at two and a quarter miles in length, 11 turns split up the current configuration. I say current because up until 1988, the track's layout was shockingly simple with a mere nine dangerously fast corners. But despite becoming a much more technical track, this difficult nature was retained in its modern form. Turn six in particular places an emphasis on precision and daring with its tricky dip at the apex and narrow racing line. But the most well-known spot on the track is of course the corkscrew. Blind and kinked on entry, it then whips the driver through a chicane which drops you nearly 60 feet. It's earned a reputation worldwide for forcing even the most daring competitors to second guess themselves. But there's honestly a refreshingly wide variety in types of corners, making it a perfect track for driver coaching and training. Elevation changes, differing cambers, and every sort of apex imaginable leave seasoned veterans and newcomers alike spending hours trying to perfect a lap. With the track becoming popular for hosting IMSA, IndyCar, and MotoGP in its recent history, it also brings out lots of vintage racers due to the Monterey historics each year. Likely to remain a fixture on the American racing scene, this legendary circuit is almost always high on drivers' best of lists. Its history and its uniqueness are sure to delight all for years to come. To admit this is one of my favorite tracks on the iRacing service uh, not just to call races on but also to get to race myself but I will uh, defer to a man who's actually got to watch the big boys uh, uh, race in person here DJ tell us a little bit how this is going to be with these indie uh, indie pro cars thanks Joe well as with any open wheel car around Laguna Seca it's gonna be a challenge especially with the uh, decreased amount of downforce that these indie pro cars are gonna have you're gonna have to do a lot of very slight subtle trail breaking as you make your way up the hill that's coming up through turns three four five and six obviously you're gonna have to be on your toes and get the corkscrew the quintessential corner on this track absolutely right you have so much weight shifting in the cars as you come down that hill and the one good thing is with the reduced downforce in these cars you're going to see a lot more overtaking than you see in the bad the big boys coming in especially coming down into that big first turn hairpin that uh andretti hairpin in turn two and i frankly think you're going to see a couple of guys trying to make an alex zanardi type move going uh side by side through the corkscrew We'll see if anybody actually tries that famous lunge into there and well, whether or not it'll come off because they do have slowdown penalties, something that Zanardi didn't have to go through. Uh, but before we get to the racing itself, a reminder that today's broadcast is proudly sponsored by Butt Kicker. Butt Kicker products add an incredible immersion in realism to any game. Feel every nuance and truly put yourself in the driver's seat. Check them out at thebuttkicker.com. If you'd like to advertise with us, GSRC offers a wealth of options to help you get your branding seen on a platform with over 1 million monthly impressions. If your organization is looking for a global audience to advertise with, look no further than GSRC. Follow our link in the description below to find out more about how you can get your brand here on the channel. Let's take a look at the points, too, as we have the uh, pro drivers currently with Josh Chin leading, as we mentioned, with two wins on the board. Of course, he is up at the front. And then we've got uh, Sirwa and Rodriguez tied for second. 
uh, behind them. Millette's not been doing too bad. A newcomer to this series who seems to have picked it up quite well. Another tie in fourth as well. Guyon and Lego, uh, all pretty tight there from second down to fourth. And then even fifth is not too far behind with uh, James Stacy, who is uh, looking to put himself into the fray. We have an AM championship in this series. So DJ, why don't you go over that? Well, leading off in the AM Championship in that top position is Dave Peterson with 64 points. Only four points behind him is the Wiley veteran Owen McLaughlin. Following him in third is Tyler Gore, and behind them Paul Wildridge and Don Bowden, only two points back of Wildridge. And as we've seen from the AM category, this is going to be a fight to the finish. These standings are tight, and I anticipate them staying that way through the final race. It'll be fascinating to watch, and I'm sure that'll be just as fiercely contested. Uh, they have a team's championship. Drivers are able to hook up with one another, create a team of their choosing, and try and vie for this. RSR Esports currently up at the top by seven points over Lavoie uh, Motorsports. So Wa contributing points to that one there. Team Talent uh, living up to their name, I guess you could say. Only 11 points behind. Those top three really closely packed, and then you got a big jump back to Blown Tranny Racing there in fourth, and Pneumatic Motorsports. Uh, kind of holding on to them in P5. So we'll see if that three car or three team rather breakaway stays the same throughout the season. Uh, why don't you run us down the race details, DJ, in case we have viewers who are just tuning in for the first time. Well, this is our third out of 10 races in this year's PRL Indy Pro Series. It is a 45 minute race, and these drivers are gonna be driving with open setups. That means that they can put whatever adjustments that they want to on these cars to get it suited just to their liking. The only caveat being is they do have a 65% fuel limit, which means they are gonna to have to come in at some point during the race. Now, there's gonna be a drive-through penalty you'll get if you accrue 11 uh, incident points, and as Joe talked about you're going to have to watch it with some of those off tracks that's very easy to pick up here around Laguna Seca and a disqualification at 20 and bonus points are available today uh, for pole fastest laps and if you manage to get away with three incidents or less. That pole position is looking very likely to go to Josh Chin right now. He's got half a second over Austin Espy and that's actually a smaller gap than what he had in practice which was up to six tenths of a second with nobody even breaking the 116 barrier, which we are yet to see here in qualifying. Uh, temperatures are pretty close to what we saw in practice at 74 degrees Fahrenheit. So I expect uh, with enough laps, we should should see Chin be able to crack that uh, that limit. So we're watching the let down in 11th. This last lap looks like it was a warm up lap for him as that one was slow with him sitting down in fifth in the championship. Certainly wants to be higher than 11th currently as Broomhead has a problem out of the final corner, it seems. I'm curious how important this qualifying will be today, DJ, because uh, in what I've seen in most cars around this track, it seems like passing tends to be pretty tough. It is. However, in these Indy Pros, it's a little bit easier than it is, I think, for example, uh, in the Formula 3s or certainly the Indy cars. Uh, because of the relatively low horsepower and the reduced downforce, you're really able to get a little bit better of a slipstream to close things up. Now, that doesn't mean that it's easy peasy on, on the overtaking like we saw, for example, at Phillip Island. But you're definitely going to see, I think, more than a few passes going into that uh, big hairpin at turn two. I also think where you're seeing a lot of guys uh, in this qualifying run make some mistakes coming out of that final corner. Very easy to run wide, very easy to make a mistake. And I think you can frankly get up behind somebody, psych them out a little bit and force them to run wide and make the pass through there. See if anybody gets clever and tries something such as that. And I'm looking at the qualifying. Sirwa up to second and only three tenths away from Josh Chin. So could David maybe throw a wrench into Josh's plans? And was he holding back as we watch the number 19 come up the hill? Let's see how he tackles the corkscrew. Breaking on the right side. This is a perfect view on board. Look at how blind it is. Oh, and he is not going to tackle it right as he throws away that lap going off with a spin. David Sorrell making the mistake that everybody and their brother has made coming around that corner as you come down through there, even on a sim like this on an onboard, you really don't appreciate just how 
massive of a drop off that is it completely unsettles the car the weight shifts completely and you have to be very very careful on the throttle when you bring on to it uh, as we watch here Lewis Zambelli coming across the line he is going to set his fastest time here at a 118.9 that's going to bump him only up to 27th place though Ike currently who's just in front of Richards here Ike does not go quicker a 16.7 has him in third so he is in the second row he was in second place on the warm-up just behind Josh Chin the one that was trailing by about those six tenths right now he's got seven tenths to make up his chin is recently improved down to a 116 flat just shy about 11 1000 short of the 116 barrier Scurali in the meantime down here in 25th uh, with a 118.7 comes down to the line let's see nope it's going to be a 119 too. a little bit slower that time by for the number 28 car so he stays in a p25 now in that am championship Right now, our highest driver in qualifying is Kevin Santana in 11th. He's not on track currently. Uh, Broomhead's chasing him and looks to be just about four tenths back behind him and is in 13th position. It's one of the things I have so much enjoyed about watching this uh, AM championship this year is that we seem to have new contenders every year for the AM win. Uh, as we watch here, Chin looks like he is on a one, he is on an outlap right now, coming across the line with a 124.8. So that's clearly not a representative time. As now we're going to follow here with Christopher Richards coming out of that very tricky last section. Sir Wa just found more time on his latest quick lap. It was a 116.3 down to three tenths of a second. Richards uh, looks like he stays put as Rodriguez currently sitting in eighth. That's not going to be his fastest. Still looking to try and improve on that 117.2, but still he is on the fourth row, which is not too bad. As we said, that track position is going to be mildly important out there today. Other thing that I feel like is going to be important is the, the pit stops, not necessarily because of the opportunities to maybe overtake through strategy, but that pit entry and pit exit around here, I really hope the drivers have practiced, DJ. <laughs> Oh, they are absolutely killer. It's honestly very reminiscent, this pit entry uh, and the ability to make a mistake of the old layout of the Chinese Grand Prix circuit, where you saw Lewis Hamilton very famously beach the car in 2007. Uh, it is so easy to not only miss the entrance to it, but come back onto the track because all you have separating you is just a narrow strip of dirty uh, of, of dirt. And so very easy to mess that up. And then coming out at the turn at the, the pit out, you have to curve your way around that turn one, stay really close to the wall, and then actually take a tighter angled version of the Andretti hairpin. It is absolutely brutal. And so there's going to be, I think, some time to gain in the pits. If you are able to do that, it may be the way to get you out and propel you forward uh, if you're not able to get it going on the track. Hamill who comes across the line. Looks like he, in, no, he did not improve, excuse me. So he stays 16th and then gets bumped to 17th as more drivers find speed. Uh, third place worth noting is incredibly tight. Ike is currently there, half a 10th back to Guyon, and then two 100s back to Austin Espity, who currently sits in fifth place. The smallest of improvements could jump you up multiple places among those drivers. And as I, we watch Robert Besaw coming across the line here, he is able to put in a good time. And now we're going to go to Andreas Ike coming down the hill after the corkscrew. That's a really difficult on-camber corner there, that turn 10. You see him doing it. You think you can take it flat out in your mind, but you really can't. And then here comes Ike coming across onto the main straight. I don't, this is going to be tight on timing. That's not going to be fast enough for him, but he's got enough time to get in another lap. Yeah, he was definitely well off of his best. So looks like uh, they are all spread out amongst the track as we watch Zambelli down in 20th. A very pretty scheme on the car is on a warm up lap himself. That's a little bit of a slow one, so he's not going to be able to chop down on that 118 flat. I think the next one across to be guy on the 808 with a 116.6 has overtaken Ike. It's still very, very tight amongst them. He's only half a tenth above him. 
as he's recently improved on the last lap. 116.6 stays put. Not a quick one. He must have had an off track somewhere on that one. And then we've got Espidy, who sits in fifth as he comes down to the line. The number seven looking to improve a 116.801. Oh, <laughs> less than a tenth slower. Oh, my goodness. He was oh so close to managing to snatch that one up. A little bit of a heartbreak there for Aspidy, but uh, starting fifth isn't going to be too terrible. The biggest concern, I think, is just going to be is a little bit of the accordion fact coming into that turn one. So we'll have to see if he's able to make it. As we now watch James Stacy here all the way back in 29th place as he comes out of that last corner. I think he might just be able to get a little bit of an improvement here, but it's not going to send him too far through the field. Yeah, that's just a four tenths of improvement. That's going to bump him up to 24th on the day. Or, yeah, 24th. Checkered flag is out on the qualifying session, so everybody's wrapping up their final flying lap roofs. The next one, he sits in 15th. He's going to stay 15th as that wasn't any quicker for him. Our house as well. That lap did not seem to count as he must have had an off track somewhere. Up next, going to be Bowden as uh, the number five is down in 27th, well mired into the field with his 118.2. Down to the line, and it's not going to see any better. Espidy, who still is in fifth. Oh, and it's a 16.6. Make it fourth place onto the second row. That is just two thousandths off of Alex Guyon. Absolutely incredible parity between the two of them. So that's going to be a very fun battle to watch. Guyon and Espidy very clearly closely matched here. Andreas Ike, uh, and he didn't find anything. So he got shuffled from third to fifth in the last few minutes of qualifying. That has got to be frustrating after he put in the second quickest time in all of practice. That's everybody. So with our grid set, let's go through our starting order today. It is a big field out here. Josh Chin managed to get the pole as we kind of figured he would. He got it down to a 15-9 in the end. David Sirwa will be starting next to him in second. Guy on in the dying stages manages to put it into third place with Espidy as well, heading up to P4. Andreas Ike down to fifth for him. He'll be flanked by Andre Millet in sixth place. Eric LeBlanc will be starting in seventh. And Rafael Ovando starts P8. Then in the fifth row, David Rodriguez will be P9. Olivier Legault starts 10th. Bring in the car, ready to start off in the 11th spot is going to be the first of the AM drivers. Michael Broomhead outside of him will be Tyler Gore. Kevin Santana and Matthew Hall going to be following them on row seven. Aaron Roos in 15th, followed by Anders Arhaus in 16th place. On row nine in 17th, Sean DeHamel followed by Peter Hebron. And behind them in row 10, Jimmy Hume and Louis Zambelli. And 21st, it's Christopher Richards. We've got Matthew Gunderson next to him and Nathaniel Ward in 23rd. Then it's James Stacy, P24. Owen McLaughlin starts 25th today, and to his outside, it's Tyler Scarali. Don Bowden will be starting 27th. You've got Dave Peterson in 28th, Adam Wright in 29th, and David Cristelli in the 30th spot. In 31st, this is going to be Robert Bissau Jr., followed by Sebastian Perlow. Uh, in 33rd, Donald Olson and Daniel Barnett in 34th, Daniel Herbert in 35th, Barry Cochran 36th, Brian Matthews 37th, and not putting in a time during this qualifying session is going to be William Lee in that 38th position. All right, so the drivers are waiting behind the pace car to take off. Now, if you want to watch your favorite driver, and it is not the one of the uh, 38 that are starting here today that we've got on screen. Check out gsrc.tv where we'll have all the live timing and scoring of every single car out on track. So you can make sure and keep track of who is where at all times. Should have the car off at any moment now as we now have Rodriguez on the track, the last of them to put it onto the grid. And then we head on our way to get the this race underway now one thing i was wondering because you talked about being flat out through rainy curve out of the corkscrew and that plunge downhill and how it's not quite there the one that i wonder about is turn four because that always feels like a marginal corner in most cars where you need either just a tiny little break or a little lift is it, is it flat out in these things it's just about 
I think if you are a little bit more talented than I am, you can probably take it flat out. But I know when I was driving it, I did not have the guts to be able to do it. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Chin, Syrah, some of these front runners able to take that corner flat out. That said, if you're following directly behind somebody, you are going to have to little lift a little bit, put a slight touch of brake in there just because of the arrow wash you're going to have coming off the car in front. This will be interesting to watch, see how the dynamic of these cars operates on this track. By the way, our highest AM driver in the end for qualifying was Broomhead. We put it into 11th. However, uh, there's a slew of AM drivers around him. Gore behind, right behind him in 12th. Santana wound up 13th. And then you have to go down to P17 for the next AM for Duhamel. Uh, but still, number of drivers looking up looking to pick up some good points there in the am chase and i'm sure if uh, they can survive some of these early laps in such a large field we'll be able to rack them up as we come up the ray hall straight to the corkscrew and then it's back downhill from there this is going to be round three of the prl indy pro series still very early in the season but josh chin has looked an indomitable force that many are struggling to keep up with, even on the oval round last round, where he made the transition quite easily from these road courses onto the circle tracks. One, two more corners to go here through turn 10 and then up to 11 as they're going to be left by the Porsche pace car and Josh Chin will have control of the field. Let's see if he goes immediately after the corner or does he give it time here? Oh, he goes immediately. Green flag is out. Chin is off like a shot with a big jump over Sawa. Guyon might have a chance down into the Andretti hairpin as they crest the hill, plunging downhill into this 180 degree left hander. Guyon does not. He gets back in line. In fact, it's quite single file behind them, which is shocking for the uh, start of a race. It is, but I think Chin just absolutely getting on that throttle early really, really helped to separate out the field as you very rarely had guys starting side by side coming out of that corner. As we now see the whole field filtering their way through four and uh, or through four and up to five. No real incidents at this point, so everybody keeping it nice and clean on this first lap. Looks like we had one in the very back. Don Bowden had an offer. He got spun around, and I think Nathaniel Ward as well went off track on his own, did not spin, and continues on. Otherwise, uh, like you said, quite clean. Josh Chin leading them up to the corkscrew for the first time. Sir Waugh starting to drop away, but he's also got a buffer between himself and the car behind, who's actually losing that spot. Guyon goes a little wide down through Rainy Curve, and Espity snatches it away. Wonderful heads up move there from Espity. Guyon just getting a little squirrely coming out of the hairpin. Espity recognizing where it is and forcing his car all the way through. As you see here, we're going to see the first effects of this draft. And it looks like uh, behind them, Ike may. Well, I thought Ike was going to be able to be taken, overtaken by Millet there. It doesn't look like it. As you see Chin starting lap two, diving down into that second turn. Oh, but Ike is looking strong. Is he look, he's around the outside of Guyon. Not enough grip there. Oh, he's too wide as he loses the spot to Millet potentially. Going to dive it right back in through turn three. They make a little bit of contact. Both of them able to continue. And this is checking up those behind them. Ovando going to be overtaken. Oh, and he comes together. That is with uh, LeBlanc. Oh, and another car shattered into the wall. Try to figure out who that I is. I think that's Rodriguez, actually, that I'm not sure what happened with him, but he is done. I just saw both of his wheels popping off the car, so that is clearly game over for him. Oh, he had to avoid the wreck in front of him and just got clipped. So, unfortunately, we'll have to get back to that later as uh, we follow this battle uphill in the mid-pack. This looks to be the fight between McLaughlin and Ovando who's trying to come back from his... Oh, and there's a big wreck in front of them. It looks like they've got the number 10 of our house and a few others involved in that. All right. Looks like Richards was involved as well as we're going to jump back on a replay here. You can see it. There they go, diving in, locking up in front, and that's just going to cause an absolute train wreck behind them. So easy to do coming in to that corkscrew section. It is a blind corner and you always, always, always seem to misjudge your breaking point sometimes. Four or five cars made contact with in that one, unfortunately. 
So a lot of damage amongst a number of drivers there in the mid pack who are going to have to come in and get repairs. Up to third place, Austin Espity is leading Guy on by about seven tenths of a second. He's not letting go. And they can both see Sirwa up ahead, but it's a full second up to our number 19, who has really fallen off of our overall leader of Chin. Josh Chin just putting on another absolute master class here, pulling away from the field. Uh, already a three and a half second gap only after about three laps. So uh, barring a mistake from Chin, I don't really see Sirwa being able to close this back in. Being spreading out a little bit here up at the front of the field. So we're going to take a look at what this has done for our AM championship because Santana has managed to pass all of those in front of him and is now our leader in that class. He's up to eighth, uh, seventh position, actually, because we had a car out who just went into the pits. That's Sebastian Crew. So the triple six uh, gaining a lot just through attrition, it seems. He is indeed starting to move his way up there, but behind him, Michael Broomhead not letting him escape too, too hard. He's only about a second or so back, definitely keeping him in his sights there. As you ride on board, you can see that Santana just ahead of him as they start to dive in. There you go. You see that little bit of lift caused by that dirty air in that third or fourth gear corner there. Santana's sort of earned the reputation of being the American Kimi Raikkonen. Uh, here on iRacing. His answers aren't always the most uh, full ones, but he is fast, as he's shown in multiple cars, both open wheelers here, and then uh, he's raced GT cars plenty on this channel. He continues to hold this one second gap over Broomhead for seventh place, although I'm getting a little bit of blinking from the 05, who seems to have some connection problems. A little bit farther back, we've got a big group in a train. Peterson in 16th with Cristelli chasing him along with Besaw and Wright. Yeah, and it looked like on that last lap, Peterson just got a little squirrely coming through the corkscrew. It let Cristelli catch up to him just a little bit, but very much Dave Peterson kind of being the cork in this bottle here, pulling everybody back behind him. Cristelli anxious to get by, start moving ahead. He's going to try to have to do it here in the next lap or so if he wants to get some good moves. Yeah, does hanging behind someone in that wake start to, to mess with the tires quite a bit? As it looks like Cristelli is good on the brakes there coming into the Andretti hairpin. Is it something where you don't want to be caught up behind just because it'll, it'll chew through them? It's less to do with the tires because this is another one of the, the morning races that this league likes to do. So the tires aren't going to be as a big of a factor. But what it really does is because of the fast nature of these corners, it almost treats it like an oval. As there goes Cristelli down the inside, he's going to hold that line coming through turn five. And he looks like he's got the move. Peterson maybe trying to fight back. But no, Cristelli's going to shut the door and hold it down up through turn six. You said he'd need to be decisive, and he was listening. He got through. Peterson's not done yet. Here comes Besaw Jr., and it's tough to pass into the corkscrew. So it looks like Robert's going to back out of it. You can set him up for later, but boy, it seemed like P uh, Peterson was under threat and potentially could lose multiple positions as his momentum was gone after that pass very easy to get in your head here at Laguna Seca because so many of these uh, are so tricky as we jump up here to P11 with Tyler Gore side by side. This is a great battle coming into turn one. Hume to his outside and the orange machine sends it deep under brakes. If he can chop down, he's got the spot. He's going to give him space though. But through the double apex, he eventually pulls away and another position gone though for Tyler Gore as James Stacy using that outside line to fantastic effect. That's one of the great things about this track, Joe, especially that turn two Andretti hairpin, is you can take multiple, multiple lines and make it work through there. As you saw James Stacy making that outside line work, able to get a little bit more momentum around it, get the speed coming back around the corner, and that moves him up into the 12th place position ahead of Tyler Gore. Well, Gore just lost his third spot in one lap because Matthew Gunderson was, man was able to get by after Tyler went off at turn four. Two wheels into the dirt slowed him down. And it's just been a miserable circuit around this track for him as they swing it through uh, the corkscrew one more time. He's actually getting backed up to that battle we were watching before, which is now being led by McLaughlin as Cristelli has drugged them all forward. 
He has. This is really turning into a massive train here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight cars just backing up is now Owen McLaughlin hoping to be able to get around his teammate, but David Cristelli just hunting him down, down the main straight. I think Cristelli's going to try to make a move here. Yes, he is. He's going to dive to the inside into the Andretti hairpin. He's got it by the braking zone. He's going to try to hold that line just right, and he does indeed. Cristelli moving himself up to 15th place. Owen not, whoa, I was going to say Owen not fighting it too hard, but behind them, Christopher Richards spun of his own accord, slammed it into the barriers, and the 49, unfortunately, going to have to take a toe for that one. So there's one of that train now gone. And here's the replay of that. You can see Richards. Oh, he just got his left tires onto that inside curbing, and that threw him out of whack and sent him spinning into the wall. I'm going to watch it one more time here from a different angle. I didn't catch that he put his tires off. I thought maybe he just goosed it too hard. But whatever the case, he is in the wall and down many, many positions. So as we come back live, let's take a look at where Josh Chin is now. 7.7 .7 seconds ahead of David Sirwa. They're only on lap eight. He is nearly a second a lap faster than anybody else on race base. Chin just absolutely running away with this race. Another incredible drive from him. Uh, just putting on a master class on how to do this. Oh, and Cristelli's got another position. And this time over Tyler Gore, who continues to plunge down the order. So the 009 snatches another one up, gets himself into 14th. And he is another one of those AM drivers. In fact, I believe that puts him in fourth in the AM class right now. Let's take another look at that. I wonder if there's some damage on Gore or something, because he's letting more of his teammates through. And here's the pass. This is down the front stretch. So it looks like he just got a good shot off of the final turn. Down to the outside. Gore saw it coming and just said, all right, you know, go on through. Yeah, I think you may be right there, Joe. It looks like Gore's just got something going on with that car. I mean, he's fallen like a stone down through the order. Could just be a minor little wing issue or something like that that he can get repaired in the pits, but we'll have to see. They just let more cars. And the thing is, is it seems like he's letting people by now. So he's not happy with the car, whatever the case is, as he was close to the top 10 and now is almost out of the top 20. Taking a glance a little bit farther up, Ike is, uh, well, he's trying to make up for a bit of a loss here. He's down one position from where he began this race. And again, he was very quick in practice. So I wonder if this is something that's kind of frustrating for him that he can't seem to repeat that pace. He's chasing Millet here for a top five, but the 44 is just out of reach. And you saw Andre Millet there a little bit ago getting the tire into the dirt. That's going to be a very scary for him as we now dive down through that corkscrew section. Absolutely beautiful. Different lines coming through there. Ike just trying to find something, anything on Millette as we dive down here into turn 10 on Camber. Great little corner. It psychs you out a bunch. And then here is that tricky, tricky, tricky left-hand turn 11 onto the main straight. Car you saw off with Scarali. That's a lap down car, so he gets it going once again. No uh, big problems there. We head into the Andretti hairpin one more time. Let, uh, oh, and we got a problem with Aaron Roofs. The Roofs not happy about something. Let's see, oh, he caught a lapped car at the wrong time. I don't think he has much right to complain. Let's see if we can get a replay of this one. It's, uh, it looks like maybe Roofs just put a little bit off by it and then you're going to see him. This happens in turn 10, so we'll, we'll come down the hill here. Looks like he's got plenty of a gap to that car in front of him. Able to get some good speed there, gets it nice and running. He's going to take it down through Rainy Curve, that turn 9. Still not sure where this incident yeah, there comes is. from. Here we go. Oh, uh, just... I don't know what Roofs is complaining about there, as it looks like he just jerked to the side. It looks like that lap car gave him plenty of room, so I'm not exactly sure if anybody but Aaron Roofs is to blame on that, frankly. 
Yeah, he clobbered that inside curb pretty hard, which if he hadn't have, I, I think you're right. I think he would have just slid through the inside. Uh, he was a very slow car, but uh, yeah, it, I, I can understand his frustration, but he might want to go take a look at that. As, let's take a look at Millet once again. I know we left that battle before, and Ike is starting to really put the pressure on. He got within two tenths of a second, and he's going to get close here. As he looks underneath, a small mistake from Millet opens the door. Ike tries to walk through twice. Hey, will the second time work? Doesn't look like it. He might have to go for a third. Millette did a really good job there closing that door through turns, turn three, just giving him enough space, but forcing him to back off. Is now here comes Ike. Do not be surprised if he tries to make a move up through maybe into the corkscrew, is I think that's going to be his next best opportunity as turn five and six that we're coming through right now. Not really enough braking to be able to turn it off. Ike now just following in those tire tracks, trying to find something, anything for him. Too far back here, it looks like, to make a pass. Maybe we'll be able to try something get a little bit more momentum. He's certainly looking strong at this point because he's making Millette think twice about things. As he slides it out of Rainy Curve, what he wants is the exit out of the final hairpin. He starts to fall back through this portion of the track. This is not good. He needs to be tucked right up beneath that rear wing. I don't think he has it now. I'm not sure he does either as Ike was as close as about a tenth of a second. And now that gap is reading at about half a second. So not anywhere near close here. Millette does. Ooh, I was going to say he doesn't make the same mistake again, but looks like he just got that rear end hanging out a little bit. That's going to let Ike catch it up maybe be able to close it in, but not anywhere near close as he was on that last lap. So in this 45 minute race, I believe we're starting to hit the pit window. Oh, and we had a problem with Michael Broomhead, the number 05. I think this was a, a mistake of his own doing. And once again, lap traffic might have a small mental uh, cause for this. Here's the replay. It'll happen down into the Andretti hairpin. That's the lapped car of Scarali in front of him. And once again, this lapped car, I don't think does anything wrong. It just seems like Broomhead is almost shaken out of his racing line by it. It's something that you see a lot more of in, uh, in multi-class endurance racing, obviously with a faster car coming through that really and truly the best way that the lapped car can be of safe, of safe to get around is to stay on that racing line. As we watch Broomhead here, yeah, Broomhead just sort of outbraked himself, got loose, got around, not the fault of the lap traffic at all. Unfortunately, the blame there lying solely on Michael Broomhead. Interesting, not a storyline that I anticipated today, DJ, that uh, we'd see traffic playing, uh, playing that sort of a role in things. Now, we've got Nathaniel Ward in the pits. He had a solo incident. Uh, uh, towards the back of the field where he slipped off at turn four. So that's why we see his car so damaged. Battle for fifth is not abated, but Ike is now six tenths back. Millette responding to the pressure and improving, keeping the 76 at arm's length. He is just doing a really good job here. The only thing we've seen uh, Millette do that was anything off the line was that brake lockup coming in down to turn two. Um, and, you know, interesting that we sort of focused in on Ward. I'm surprised we haven't seen anybody trying to pit here. Uh, we are about 15 minutes into the race. We could start to see him here in the next lap or so. By my calculations, our pit window is going to be about, I would say, uh, 20 minutes in to 35 minutes in, about that 15-minute window for these guys to try to do it. So don't be surprised if we start to see, start, see some guys start peeling off. Track temperatures are also going up at a decent rate with this being the morning race, like DJ mentioned. It's uh, up to 79 degrees Fahrenheit now, and we're actually uh, past 11 in the morning here, so that's only going to continue to increase. We are getting a little bit of cloud cover, so maybe that'll help that just a tiny bit. I wonder if we could go back to one of those trains that we were watching before in the mid-pack that was, had some really good action. His 11th place with James Stacy has Gunderson and Cristelli in there. Then they got a bit of a jump back to McLaughlin. So it's almost like two little trains have formed here out of what was once a big one. They have it, as you see there, that's Cristelli and Gunderson coming through that Andretti hairpin. One of the hardest things to do if you are a driver following is make sure you don't run into the back of guy in front of you on that curve because you really have to slow down at that apex. 
very, very difficult and also very easy if you're the, uh, the driver in front to maybe give a little bit of a brake check and make the guy be a little gun shy and get yourself a couple tenths of advantage going down the straight. That seems like a dangerous game to me. <laughs> trying to, you have to really trust the person behind you if you're trying to brake check them, especially at a track like this. As they come up to the corkscrew once again, Gunderson can't get it underneath the gearbox of James Stacy right here, but he was close on the first half of the course. Let's see if that repeats itself. If maybe the number 33 likes the braking for the Andretti hairpin a little bit more. He very well might, as you see them starting to gap out a little bit there from David Cristelli and start to make this a two-man battle up front with Cristelli just watching. Cristelli taking a bit of a narrow line off that final corner. That's going to compromise his exit speed very slightly, not get as good of a run here as uh, as Gunderson does. It look like he has it. Somebody locking up in front of him there. Uh, I think that was uh, Michael Broomhead ahead of them, locking up pretty heavily. So that's going to draw Broomhead into this battle with Stacy now as well. And that was Broomhead lapping Scarali again. Remember, we saw him make that mistake earlier. Uh, he had to do the same thing all over again. Now this, this battle... 11th place has caught Scarali. Is he going to stay off to the right here? Is he going to let them through? Yes, he is. Nicely done by the 28. One gets through, two gets through. Not quite all three. Cristelli is the odd man out, and especially odd man out because he has to go through an awkward line through turn six. He makes it work, but that was a little bit of a sketchy moment for him. Definitely a little bit of a nail biter, and it certainly cost him some time. Looks like it cost him about three or four tenths of a second there, so he's going to be ruining that. As you still see there, that's uh, Scarelli just trying to get out of the way of everybody as it's so difficult to not be a nuisance when you're coming through the Ooh, corkscrew. I, I got by Millette. I think this... Did this happen recently? I'm trying to check. It did. It happened within the past lap, and it was up into the corkscrew, so maybe about 60 seconds ago. The 76 took advantage of a mistake and the, just pounced on it. Here we go, right? Er, no, excuse me, we're still live. <laughs> I, think, I think we've got the, here's the replay on the pass. Let's see if we can dig this one up. Here we go, right here, this is perfect. This is Millette going a little wide. No, maybe just a little bit of a slip up. Well, that's, this is bizarre. I didn't see much wrong from that angle. I mean, it looks like he just got maybe an inch of his right tires over the line there. Maybe some tire spin coming off the line and that's all it's gonna cost you if you are Andre Millette and that's enough for Andreas Ike to get by. So kudos to him. Ike now setting his sights ahead of him on Alex Guyon, who's one point, who's just over a second ahead of him with Millette still hot on his heels. So this is gonna be a very interesting battle as we go along here. Credit to Andreas who had been working on that pass for a long, long time. Now you might've noticed that we do have a lot of traffic that the drivers are dealing with. Just to give you an idea, we only have 19 cars left on the lead lap. Donald Olson is the last one in the 413 out of 38 starters. And honestly, we've lost a good chunk of them to attrition. I am sort of aghast that we have so few cars on the lead lap. As we jump back here, back into that amazing battle we've been watching, as it looks like uh, that's going to be Dave Peterson, Owen McLaughlin, and Matthew Gunderson. That one, two, three really starting to shape up into a nice battle here. Yeah, it is McLaughlin who's in the middle of the sandwich behind his teammate Gunderson and ahead of Peterson. As Josh Chin sets another fastest lap of the race up at the front. Uh, let's stay here, but he is 13 seconds ahead of Sirwa at this point. McLaughlin climbing, sending it through turn six, a little bit off the apex. Is this gonna cost him? Peterson's got a good run. This could be a repeat of what we saw with Ike and Millette. He manages to outbreak him up into the corkscrew and he's tidy to the apex. Nice job by the 35. That is how you do it if you are Dave Peterson. That's an absolutely textbook overtake there. As you see James, or Owen McLaughlin rather now being held into the clutches of uh, Robert Besaw there. So this uh, this day is not getting any better for Owen McLaughlin. That looks like that's actually Ovando. That's a lapped car just behind him. So that's not for position. Uh, we do have some takers in pit lane. Jimmy Hume with a scheduled stop, it appears. 
And I think we've also had Daniel Barnett come in and out many laps to go for his stop. Hume is back out. Is he going to be in clear air? And he might have traffic. That's Scarali, who's a lapped car. So that could go either way, depending on if Scarali is willing to let him through easily. As we see him here, as they start out, Scarali not looking like he's going to off the bat. Uh, but uh, once Hume gets his tires up to temperature, certainly look him to have way more speed. Meanwhile, I think that the 76 is being slowed up by Millet. Look at this. He's already pulled away to about a second and a half, and he's on top of Guyon. The 808 suddenly has a mirror full of the Scandinavian. As we ride on board with his machine, you can see there's just about two or three car lengths between them for fourth place. Really turning into another good battle here. Andreas Ike just pushing everything he's got to the line. He's going to try to keep it. Falls back a little bit there. He's going to lose just a hair of time there. So we're going to have to see what he can do as we get up to the hairpin. This is going to be a great, great place to overtake for Ike. He's able to close up that gap. Has it down to about 0.3 seconds. He's going to be right behind him. Watch for the pass in the corkscrew. He's done it once. Does he dare try it twice? I don't think he's got the run, but he still holds right there, keeping the pressure on. B Saw Jr., who is a lapped car, is in front of them. That could play a factor. Let's see if he is able to get out of their way in time, or could he provide a pick? He's a little bit slow, out of rainy curve. They are gaining on him hand over fist as they now come out of turn 10. And then, oh, what a call by Ike. Suddenly decides it's time to pit. Could, oh, and Besaw just spun right in front of Guyon. That might wind up being the time that Ike needs that could slow up Guyon. I a look at go this. ahead. I, I honestly think there that if I'm Alex Guyon, I need a new pacemaker after that, as he saw his life <laughs> flash before his eyes. You can see B-Saw just absolutely losing it, and Guyon able to expertly get around that, able to save it. But I agree with you. He had to let up there, and I think that may give Ike the advantage as they come out of the pits. Yeah, last lap was almost a second slower than his quickest. More than a second slower than his quickest. So Guyon was held up slightly. Great, great stuff from Alex to keep from running into him because that could have easily been wing damage and that probably would have been worse. Right now, our highest pitter is Ike, who's back out in seventh place. Millet actually followed him in, worth noting. Uh, so the 44 is also done and still following, not super closely, but within a second of the 76. And it looks like our leader is now jumping into the pits here. Joshua Tin taking his pit stop on lap 20. So this is going to kick off. I think absolutely everybody's starting to come in now. Espidy doesn't go in. Looks like Sir Wa stays out, but Guyon is in. He responds to Ike. He's not going to try and let him jump him in this pit cycle. And that was Chin that you just saw leaving pit lane. Let's see where Ike cycles out. Don't think he's been held up by traffic on this one. Guyon in his stall. Should be a quick stop. 7.1, slightly quicker than Ike. And there goes up. Oh! Oh, no. Too greedy on the power off of the limiter. And Guyon watches multiple places fly by. Looks like that's going to drop him down to at least P8 by the end of that. But just a oh, heartbreak for a really good drive there for Alex Guyon. But gifting Andreas Ike that next position up into fourth place now, which effectively, I think, could get him up into third by the end of all of the pit stop cycles. Oh, goodness. Well, Ike now who is in fourth has suddenly found himself under pressure from the very man that he gave lots of pressure to. Millet, that is the 44, seeing uh, a sudden spate of speed. And look at this, our top AM driver. That's Broomhead, and that is for position. Oh, excuse me, he has not pitted yet. So he's slightly off cycle. That's why we're seeing him up this high. Nevertheless, still a great drive there from Broomhead, really able to get it in as Millette, able to stay right and tight behind Ike. That's only going to be about 0.3 seconds as they cross the line. 
Millette really trying to claw him in here. I don't think he's going to have enough to get him through the hairpin, but enough to put pressure on Ike and try to make him a mistake. And indeed, looks like he almost started to, but Ike able to catch it, getting a little squirrely there, but that's going to draw in Millette just a little bit more. Everybody has now pitted. The last of our drivers are in the lane, and it is a straight fight from here to the line. Millette is our closest fight here for just outside the podium. Ike holding down fourth. They are three seconds back from Espity. With Ike being able to uh, make great pace as soon as he was clear of Millette, I kind of wonder if these two don't fight, could they maybe run down the seven? It's possible, but as I was looking through that last, uh, those last last sector times, and granted, Ike did come across on a little bit of lap traffic there. He dropped about two tenths of a second, so I think Espity may have him in, in check here. But uh, stranger things have happened. We'll have to see what Ike's able to do. Now he responds to the threat from the 44 behind and gives himself a little bit more comfortable gap of about half a second. Onto the front stretch once more, one of the, or probably the longest straight, even though it isn't straight, up and over what is technically turn one and down into the Andretti hairpin, the first braking zone of the lap. Millette just sticking with it and seeing if he can squeeze anything out of fourth place. I think Millette trying to do the sort of reverse Andreas Ike here on Andreas Ike and just try to force Ike into a mistake, um, which is a good strategy, but uh, with somebody as calm and cool as collected as Andreas Ike, that may not pay out for him. We'll have to see. I wonder if we're switching around for certain drivers because the temperatures are now up to 81 degrees Fahrenheit on the track surface. Are these cars susceptible to the temperature changes where, you know, cooler temperatures, it'll handle fine, and then suddenly it heats up and it just feels like a mess? Very much so, because you have such little downforce on these cars, and it is it is at a premium. If it gets hotter and a little less humid, you can certainly tell a difference. But I would say that really only starts to kick in after about 90 or so degrees. When you're down in the low 80s on track temperature, these cars are going to handle relatively similar. It's going to be pretty good across the board once you get those tires up to town. Well, right, Andreas, I was trying to give you an out, <laughs> and uh, seems that temperature's not the one. But credit to him, he is uh, pulled away from Andre to about a second as yet more lap traffic uh, that they're having to navigate. Pulls out of the way. Brian Matthews was that uh, blue and black machine that they went by. And Joe, you may have hit the nail on the head here as I look at the GSRC live timing and I'm noticing that Ike has that gap down to Espity only to about 1.3 seconds. So we may very well be in a battle here for third place is that is Espity ahead of him. That sort of blue car that you see in the distance of the shot, that is third place of Espity. So Ike on the charge here. I wonder if the traffic had something to do with it. If, if so, uh, credit to Ike because he navigated it better and lost less time. But yeah, one and a half seconds onto the podium. Andreas, who qualified in fifth place, trying to make up for what seemed like an uncharacteristic session for him as we now ride on board, coming around the final corner and across the line one more time. Really positioning that car just perfectly, getting out onto the rumble strips, not getting onto that AstroTurf as that will just send you spinning into the wall. As he's now got that gap down to about a second or so, just under a second on Espity, really pushing him hard there. As you see, just the tires getting tortured, coming through, gets a little bit wide. That's going to cost him about a tenth of a second. But make no mistake, Andreas Ike is coming for Austin Espity here. Or if maybe it was just after the pit stop, he needed to get his tires back into the working range because I'm looking at the times and Ike is on it now. It is his quickest lap was lap 23 at a 16.7, followed it up with uh, a 17.5. Some of that was with the lap traffic. But you compare that to Espity who ran a 18.4, a 17.9. And now I think this one is also going to be quicker once again for Ike. Uh, Espity behind it looks like our house who we saw have some problems on the early laps so he's a lapped car and he's going to try and pull off to the left is he going to let him through no not through here there it's he gonna, goes there he goes diving off that's that's good for the uh, for all the good action here 
As you see now, who's that in the back of your screen? That's Andre Millet starting to close back in now on Andreas Eich. So none of these drivers giving any quarter as we go on board here. That's, uh, that is Eich only about eight tenths of a second ahead of him. So this could very well shape up into a three-way battle here with about 10 minutes to go left in this race. Eich and Millet have just been on a yo-yo fight back and forth, back and forth. I really am not sure who is the stronger of the two at this point. 11 minutes left to go means that the opportunities will dwindle down quickly. Granted, they are somewhat short laps around here. And indeed, Millet, man, you said eight tenths of a second? Try three tenths, and it's only been half a lap. Millet and Ike here, just every time one of them gets ahead, it seems like the other one's able to just come and claw back at it. As ahead of Ike, though, Austin Espy, that gap is up to 1.3 seconds again. So I think that's a combination of Espy clearing that traffic that looks like what it caused him to fall back into the clutches of Ike. But I think Ike's also starting to drive in his mirrors a little bit here as he's getting a full view of Andre Millet starting to really make a charge. Not the thing that he wants right now, especially if this is hurting his pace. As they come to the line, I'm watching the lap times this time through Espity with a 17-1. Ike, a 17-5, four tenths slower. And then Millet with a 17-1. He is on pace with Espity and takes a little peek down into Andretti, but not a serious attempt. He's got to watch that a little bit there from Andre Millet. He got a little squirrely coming off of turn 11 as well. So he clearly wants this position. But uh, discretion needs to be the better part of Valley here, at a place, especially at a place like Laguna Seca. So he's going to have to be careful and really just apply the pressure and make sure not to make a mistake himself. Mistake free seems to be the name of the game for a number of drivers uh, up here towards the front. Remember, we saw Broomhead lose multiple positions with his own error. We saw a driver DNF uh, trying to avoid lap traffic. And now these two have been back and forth with the smallest of margins between them. As they plunge down through Rainy Curve once again, Millet within six tenths of a second, Ike holding station at about 1.1 behind Espity. They're not budging a lot here now. I wonder if they're just trying to take it easy a little bit, recognize where they've got to go. As you see there up ahead, uh, that's Ospin Espity trying to get a little bit of the draft off that lap car in front of him and uh, lap car getting off to the side and denying Espity that draft. So just one of those sort of interesting tactics you do if you are up in front. A sigh of relief from the let because that was b -Saw Jr. Remember, he was the one that spun right in front of Guyon earlier on. So as they manage to get by, no dramas there. The gaps stay about as they were one second from Ike to Espity, seven tenths. Oh, and Ike is off. Ike is in the wall out of turn four. Oh, my goodness. As we go wreck here, for him. We're going to get a replay of this. As you see, he comes through the corner, gets it wide, hooks it, and just slams into that wall. Left tires getting too much onto the dirt, upsetting the car, and that is going to end a great drive for Ike. That is a shame after all we've seen from him. So he is in pit lane. He had to take a tow car, could not continue on. This uh, bumps up Millet into fourth. Guyon gets bumped up into fifth by that as uh, he will inherit it since his issues a little bit earlier coming out of the pits, making the best of a bad situation for him. It also promotes our highest AM driver, Kevin Santana, up into sixth. As we jump here to take a look at Alex Guyon, you can see him just working his way forward. That's Santana right behind him, actually, putting up a good fight. So that could end up being something a little bit interesting here. Guyon obviously recovering from that pit stop error, and Santana looking to take a bite at the big boys. Yeah, we talked about AM drivers looking for big points. And I think a top five would definitely qualify as big points as the triple six just hugs it right underneath the gearbox of Alex Guyon. And looks like he's gaining at times a little bit of a slide out of turn four. It's going to cost him some of that, though. 
Yeah, that's going to cost him a little bit, but it may help him as you come through these fast corners. You're not going to be having as much of an arrow wash. You'll be able to keep it a little bit tighter there, keep it a little bit more all together. Uh, but Santana not letting Guyon slip away at all here. So Santana certainly in the driver's seat, seeing what he can do. Earlier, I was talking about how few drivers are left on the lead lap. We're down to 12 drivers on the lead lap here as this fight gets even hotter. A little bit of a look. Can Santana complete it down into turn 10? He's given space, but it's a banked corner. So the momentum around the outside for Guyon, he's able to rebuff him. As they head it down into the final hairpin. Guyon recovers well and keeps Santana behind. But for how long? Santana pulls the draft up and over the crest of one. The door once again left open and Santana is able to outbreak him down into the Andretti hairpin, the triple six into the top five. Amazing sequence of corners there from Kevin Santana, just absolutely not letting up on the pressure, taking every advantage given to him. And if I'm Alex Guyon, I don't know why I'm not fighting for those corners harder. I mean, he just let him have them. Very, very uncharacteristic from Guyon. Check in real quick to see if there's any damage on Guyon after his spin, because I'm trying to remember if he hit the wall. I think, oh, he, uh, yeah, I think he has a tiny little bit, maybe? I'm not seeing anything, but I, that could just be a reflection on the quality of my monitor, Joe. So uh, it looks like Guyon just he locked up a little bit there coming into the corkscrew. But uh, honestly, I think with Guyon, that's just a better drive from Santana. Santana's just hungry and went for it. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm looking here on a director's camera and doesn't look like there is any damage. Let's head back uh, to two drivers. We haven't covered a whole lot, but are in a nice battle to Hume and Hall. This is for seventh place here. And boy, what a climb has it been for Hume from 19th to 8th position. If he can get up to seventh, all the better. It would be an amazing drive for Jimmy Hume, really just trying to capitalize here. As he's going to go, thinks about going down the inside of the Andretti hairpin here. He's going to think better of it, take a little bit of a different angle there, trying to just maybe force Hall into a mistake. As uh, in front of them, we've got Ooh, some... Guy on. Guy on running wide again. So Guy on clearly just in... Whoa, is that yeah. a lap? No, yeah, that's that a lap car. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Ambelli just uh, giving way, making sure that everybody can get through. But I think that threw Guy on off a little bit as Hall is right underneath him here. Could we even see Hume get up to sixth place potentially? I think that, oh, you know what? I wondered maybe if Guyon underfueled. Maybe that's why we're seeing him so slow here. He could have. I mean, his pit stop line was in line with most everybody else who came oh. in. Oh, there he goes down the inside as he's going to try to make it work. That's Hall, but that's going to open up the door to Jimmy Hume, and he's going to try to do the over-under through Rainy Curve. Not having it, though, he's going to fall back in the line, and they're going to say nice and single file here through turn 10, but watch for the Andretti hairpin. This is going to get nasty. That got really tense for a moment. And if he is having to lift and coast, this is the part where Guyon could be very vulnerable as he's got to lift down into the Andretti hairpin. He pulls away quite nicely, so Hall not going to have the opportunity here. He's not, and there you see the benefits. And Ooh, little bit of a slip there from Matthew Hall. That may put him at home back into consideration with it is this is the best battle on the track really really good slicing and dicing Hume is pushing hard he wants these spots as they come up the hill here swinging it down through turn five a very good run from hall but it takes a brave man to send one into turn six he knows it he lifts a little bit holds out Oh, but now he is slow off of turn six and Hume starting to gain. Does he defend? No, he takes to the racing line. Hume doesn't quite have an answer. He doesn't, but Hume is going to get a pretty decent run. At least he did in the first part of it. But it looks like through that, though, that uh, it's actually Hall that got the better run on Guyon. They are closing that gap up as we come in through turn 10 down to 11. If he can get this right, he may be able to have the momentum to get him down into the Andretti hairpin. They get hard on the power. He's able to get it. Oh, is that a spinner behind him? Uh, but that's going to gap again. Is Guyon able to pull off of that final corner just a little bit better and buy himself some breathing room into turn one? 
Less than three laps to go. Incredibly, they are actually, uh, <laughs> they are actually almost going to be lapped by Josh Chin because he is about the front stretch behind them currently. That is how far up he's gone through this field. Guyon having more traffic in front of him is only going to cause him yet more headache as he goes a little wide through turn four and Hall gets a great run up to turn five. He's got the inside. Can he accelerate off the turn? Yes, he can. And Guyon loses one spot. Is it going to be two? Hume thinks about it, thinks twice, comes off of turn six. Oh, but it's a great run for Guyon. He can fight back if he wants to on Hall. Up the Ray Hall straight. And no, he is going to actually play defense instead. Oh, slipping wide. Hume losing gobs of time. Ah, uh, that was tricky there for Hume. Guyon looked like he was going to go for that overtake into the corkscrew. Thought better of it. Lifted, got out of the throttle. And I think that just threw Hume off. Got him not looking at his uh, braking marker. And that's what ended up getting him in there. But uh, Guyon now able to close in close on Matthew Hall. So this is not over yet by any stretch. Yeah, I'm sure he wants that spot back. And by the way, one lap to go for Chin, two to go for these two, all fighting for uh, sixth place between the 911 and the 808. There is our leader taking the white flag. Just as he took the white flag, these two were heading through the Andretti hairpin. So I think they will make it away without being lapped. But boy, was it close. And I think Hall is starting to put himself out of reach. He is starting to put himself out of reach a little bit, but as we saw on that last lap, this is the section of the track where Guyon was able to make up a little bit of time and make thing. We're gonna jump on with Hume here as he tries to get a run on Guyon. But once again, through that turn six, that is just Guyon's sweet spot. He is able to get such a good run out of that corner and down into the corkscrew that he's able to keep Hume behind him. And instead, he's actually able to close up a little bit there. Uh, but here comes Hume fighting back. It's not over yet. They're going to have one more lap to do it. As we watch them come up to the final turn, sometimes that's a sneaky place to get a pass in, but not this time through. I'm not sure if we'll be able to watch them down to the Andretti hairpin because behind them, Josh Chin comes to the checkered flag out of the final turn. A hat trick at the start of the season for the number 93. Stunning stuff. As it looks like Guyon held Hume off into the first corner. So that and Hume is spinning. Hume has spun out coming out of the Andretti hairpin there. Oh, and there goes that battle. He was awful close to the wall, but the car looks whole. So I think he got away with it. Sir Wa, a long ways back, 25 seconds behind. And now he comes down to take second with Austin Espy not far back to round out the podium. Really strong drive here from all of our podium finishers. Obviously, Josh Chin just putting in a masterclass once again on how to drive these Indy Pro cars. And Sawa and Espity not being a slouch is behind him. That 20 second gap from Sawa uh, back. Just really, really good heads up drive. Let's take a look at that spin. I'm sure that Hume probably wouldn't want us to show it, but he did take a, a try at it. So he looked a long way around and then tried to gun it off the curve. Ah, just car ran out of grip. Hume just getting a little over eager there, trying to put too much throttle in. As we see now, Guyon uh, crossing the start finish line to come home. That's another good run. He obviously had some problems there coming out of the pits and all of that, but a really good recovery drive to come home fifth. So kudos to him. Hume, the last car on the lead lap after all that fell to 10th place. So that's going to take us to break here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. We'll come back with the unofficial results as well as driver interviews. Stick around because on screen you'll see all the upcoming races here on the Global Sim Racing Channel.
Welcome back to Laguna Seca. We just watched round three in the PRL Indy Pro 2000 series. And up at the front, Joshua Chin put on just an incredible display of speed today, he, where he finished 25 seconds ahead of the next car, David Sawa, who claimed P2. And then Austin Espedy, who was a few seconds behind, rounded out the podium. Andre Millette had to fight hard for this fourth place, but I'm sure he felt like he earned that one. And then Kevin Santana, our top AM driver, takes a top five from 13th on the grid. Following him up the order, Matthew Hall went from 14th to 6th. And then Guyon slipped up, exiting the pit lane, and unfortunately gave a lot away. He went from 3rd to 7th. James Stacy uh, from 24th to 8th position. And that is with a qualifying. That is a legit hard charger right there. Even better, Chris Stelly from a 30th to a 9th. And then Jimmy Hume, who we saw spun on the very last lap, rounds out your top 10 and last on the lead lap. Yeah, if you want to know just how dominant of a drive it was, the 11th place car is a lap down courtesy of Josh Chin, and that being Michael Broomhead. Behind him in 12th is Dave Peterson, uh, Olivia Legault, and Adam Wright coming home 12th and 13th. Matthew Gunderson in 15th. Owen McLaughlin recovering from that spin early on to come home in 15th uh, as Donald Olson in 17th, Aaron Roofs in 18th, Robert Besaud in 19th, and Louis Zambelli in 20th. Burnett took 21st with Barry Cochran in 22nd. You've got Tyler Gore in P23, followed by a Bear in 24th and Brian Matthews in 25th. This is when you get the cars who had big problems. Ward uh, got back out there eventually and claimed 26th, our house in 27th, and Ike was our first DNF and 28th from there on down it was drivers that did not see the checkered flag unfortunately the driver that saw the checkered flag first was joshua chin and he saw it a long ways before anybody else did because josh just spanked the field here today what in the world did you have that everybody else did not you were miles ahead in in practice you were miles ahead in qualifying and then followed it up with the race as well that that was astonishing sir um well, I would say setup, but uh, that setup's available on Craig's setup shop to anyone. Um, just ran that setup straight up. So uh, I don't want to say it like this, but I guess it's all on the driver. I, I guess to put it in, in youth speak, get good, basically. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, man, you, you've gone from Phillip Island uh, uh, to an oval at Phoenix to another road course here, and all three of them you've managed to take victory and, and definitively it's looking pretty good this season. Uh, are you letting that get to your head at all? Do you feel that confidence or is that something that you try not to let yourself feel? Um, I've got confidence, but I think most of it is just a reflection of having the, the prep time of doing two to three hours of set of work every week on the car. And it kind of rolls over into running these races um, coming into practice. I knew, roughly where I wanted to be on pace and I was hitting my targets right away. So I felt good about it, but it's not a, I don't feel overconfident because I'm thrashing people. I feel confident because I've got the time put, already put in and I know where I'm going to be at and where I should be at. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, the next round, however, could be at least a little bit worrying because we're heading over to Detroit. Uh, that one kind of can always bite at any time. I, I assume you're probably going to be putting a lot of practice into that one. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to tear off some left fronts and right fronts going around there uh, this weekend, getting ready for it. Uh, I love Detroit, and for the most part, I have pretty good luck there. So um, especially I've run IndyCar quite a bit there. So uh, something with a little less power should be a little less tricky. It's still pretty tricky with the bumps, but not quite as bad. We'll, we'll keep an eye out for you. Again, congratulations on an emphatic win, and we'll look out for you in Michigan. Thank you, guys. That was Josh Shin, our winner. And then up next, DJs uh, with David Sirwa, who went uh, from second to second. Yeah, I'm very happy. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, go ahead, man. Uh, how was it? Well, it was a quiet race, uh, uneventful, uh, but with five laps to go, uh, I, I had a contact with a lapper, I think it was uh, David Herbert, uh, and uh, it, uh, he spun ahead of me in the corkscrew uh, chicane, 
and uh, we had a light contact enough to uh, to uh, damage my front wing and i was uh, one second slower in the last five laps i was looking forward for the white bag how was it out there with the lap traffic i mean it almost seemed like it was a multi-class race out there just the way you guys were having to slice and dice through it oh it was not that bad um, the lappers uh, did a very good job uh, letting me by um, I have nothing to say, and David Herbert, is, it's just a mistake. It's nothing uh, I can complain about. Well, we're headed uh, all the way to Detroit and the tight, narrow walls of a street course next week. How do you like your chances when we head there? I have no idea. Uh, the, car, the, the track will be completely, uh, completely different, but I think uh, my driving style will uh, suit uh, for that kind of track. So I think I uh, will have a good result. Well, wonderful. David, we wish you the absolute best of luck, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. That was our second place finisher, David Sirwa. And we've got Austin Espity with us as well. The New Englander went from fourth to third after you snuck up into the uh, podium position early on. It, it looked like smooth sailing until about midway through the race. Suddenly, it seemed like you were being caught. Were you just kind of taking it easy, or is that your your maximum pace? I think I got some damage early. Oh, in the second half of the stint, I think I damaged the front wing, so it was slowing me down a little bit with uh, loads of understeer, so I wasn't able to get full potential out of the car in the second stint. I was just trying to hang on and do as much as I can to hang on to the podium. Well, you did just that and managed to to keep it, but it it seems like everybody's kind of having a hard time holding up with Josh Shin. He says that the setup is available uh, for anybody to take. I mean, is that what it's going to take for you? Are you going to look into that and see if you can find some speed to, to somehow run him down? Well, J Josh and I were on the same set on Team Talent. Uh, thanks to Josh again for putting on an amazing set. He's just on another level than I am. I know on ovals we're even, but on road courses he always has always has the upper hand. Well, still a third place is nothing to be ashamed of here. So before we let you go, do you want to give any thanks to anybody? Just the Josh for putting all this hard work in the sets each and every week, and John HD for the oval setups, setups, and everyone at uh, Team Talent. Well. That was our third place finisher, Austin Espity. And then our top AM finisher with a top five, DJ, is going to try and squeeze some words out of Kevin Santana. Kevin, you really drove your way up through the field today, put on a great display. How was it out there? Hair raising. How so? I mean, it looked like you were having a lot of problems with lap traffic. Was that, uh, was that the biggest concern for you? Well, that in the beginning, a few wrecks in front of me. Never something to lower your blood pressure around iRacing. I get that. Uh, we're heading into Detroit uh, next week. That's going to be obviously a place where I think wrecks are going to be quite common. How do you like your chances? Can we just burn the track down? <laughs> well, I know. I think Roger probably have a few things to say about that. But uh, no, um, this is going to move you good up in, in AM standings. How do you like your chances in the championship? Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. The schedule doesn't seem to favor some of my favorite, my better tracks. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, uh, Kevin, before we let you go, anybody you need to thank tonight? You know, all the guys that put this on week in and week out. Fantastic. Kevin, thanks for chatting with us, and uh, congratulations again on the fifth place spot. Thank you. Fifth place finisher, Kevin Santana, uh, giving his uh, usual interview as we close up here today. We also want to give some thank yous, including to our sponsor, Butt Kicker, who can be found at thebuttkicker.com. Thanks to the PRL for bringing us back for another season of coverage. Also, thank you to the companies that provide the software and the hardware for our broadcast listed here on your screen. Additional thanks to Junior Wand, and on screen is how you can find more of her great work. Thanks to the team today, DJ, Sean, and Dougie. If you'd like to find out more about GSRC, including upcoming races, you can find it at GlobalSimRacingChannel.com. You can check out our social media on Twitter at GSR Channel, Facebook at Global Sim Racing Channel, and Instagram at GSRC underscore Graham. The next race, as we mentioned, heading off to Michigan. That'll be Thursday, October 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern. 
We have upcoming races for other series listed on the screen, so check those out and mark them down on your calendar. In a few moments' time, we have the Throwback IndyCar Series starting up with the Daytona Road Course. That'll be at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. However, until next time, race clean, race hard, and see you on the track.